Just waiting for the recording to start. Okay, the recording is on. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to BC 308, our course on Revelation and Daniel. We're going to pray and get started and uh, looking forward to the class today. We are going to get into the book of Revelation today. So, um, Really excited about that. Uh, looking forward to it. Let's uh, pray. And uh, maybe, uh, Thomas, why don't you pray? Uh, maybe we'll get started. I'll pray, Pastor. Father, in his name we thank you. We praise you for the wonderful day, Lord. You are good. And your goodness will follow all the day. Thank you, Jesus, for your kindness and mercy. That as we sit and listen your word, Father, to understand, help us to receive everything. Holy Spirit, help us to understand. Thank you, Jesus, for this wonderful time. Let other students also quickly join and equip in the word of God. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, um, Thomas. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody, once again, and uh, welcome to the class. Um, I think Aaron is having problems connecting. <laughs> mm, she's uh, connected about three or four times and dropped off. But anyway, uh, we're going to get started. Um, uh, today, we are getting into the book of Revelation. I just wanted to, before we move, move forward, uh, does anybody have any questions, any doubts, or any you know any anything you want to discuss on what we've covered in the book of Daniel before we get into the book of Revelation? Um, any any questions so far? I mean, any questions on Daniel? Okay. Uh, no questions, but you know, just feel free at, at any point uh, to, you know, if any anything comes up, uh, anything doesn't seem to be clear uh, from Daniel, uh, feel free at any point to ask. So today we are moving forward into the book of Revelation, and I'll just kind of do an introduction today. We we'll just get started, and uh, then we will go. So of course, our goal is to read, you know, verse by verse, uh, chapter by chapter, and. Um, to do our best to understand the book of Revelation. Just a little bit of background. Some of these things are already in the uh, PDF notes, but just by way of background, uh, we all know that the book of Revelation was the last uh, book in the New Testament to be written, written by John, or John wrote down the revelation he received. John, one of the apostles of Jesus, uh, the beloved also known as the beloved disciple. Um, and this was written around AD 95. So almost uh, close to the end of that first century. Uh, this was uh, almost 60 years after uh, uh, the resurrection uh, and the ascension of Christ. And um, by this time, uh, uh, Emperor Nero, who had persecuted the Christians, really killed them and was responsible for killing Peter and Paul. And other, you know, he had gone off the scene. There was a new emperor um, who uh, his approach uh, in uh, persecuting the Christians or trying to, you know, control this Christian movement or Christianity. His approach was not necessarily killing people, but banishing them, getting them out. And so oh, he felt one of the best things to do was to um, uh, banish John, who was the last remaining voice or apostle. And so he banished him off to the island of Patmos, uh, which, and I'll we'll look at the map a little later, uh, which is a small island of the from 
away from Ephesus. Ephesus was a seaport town. So if you look at modern day map, uh, it will be in the country of Turkey. On the west coast of Turkey, you have Ephesus, small port town. And away from that, into the ocean, into the sea, the Aegean Sea, uh, was a small island called Patmos. And so he just decided to send John away over there. And John was elderly by this time, uh, well up in age, and he was sent to be alone there. So, you know, at least he doesn't have much influence uh, on the church and so on. And very interestingly, while he is there, uh, just some other some other details is uh, if you just go back a little bit or just you know a few decades earlier uh, during the time of the apostle Paul and we are talking now about uh, AD 50, AD 60 when Paul was busy doing his missionary journeys he had spent uh, on his third missionary journey he had spent uh, about three years maybe a little over three years at Ephesus. And uh, during that time, he had raised up the younger generation, Timothy, Titus, and a lot of others. The names are there in Acts 18. So he had raised up any leaders. And also from Ephesus, uh, we, uh, we could say that a uh, lot of, you know, maybe I don't know, in today's terms, you may say satellite churches or branch churches or daughter churches, you know, many other churches were planted in and around that region. So we're basically talking about the western side of modern day Turkey, with reference to those times it used to be called Asia Minor, you know, smaller part of Asia. But Paul had successfully trained up younger leaders and other churches were planted, which were not far from Ephesus. And so Ephesus in, in one way was like the headquarters or the main, the mother church, you know, uh, taking in overseeing or responsible for these other plants that had come, church plants that had come. Uh, Paul himself didn't visit these other churches, but in some way instrumental because he had trained leaders and the influence came from the church in Ephesus. So this is, we are going back in time to around 80, 50, 80, 60. Uh, when the Apostle Paul was, you know, ministering in those areas. And uh, after Paul had gone to Rome, that was after his third missionary journey, and he had, you know, he was sent to Rome. Uh, he had spent two years in Rome, and he was briefly released for uh, some time. When he came uh, back to um, um, the island of Crete, where he appointed Titus, to oversee the work there. So Titus was one of the people Paul had already discipled. And then he appointed Timothy to be in charge of the church in Ephesus. So Timothy, you know, we, we know Paul uh, dis discipled him or trained him. And he appointed Timothy to be in charge of the church in Ephesus. And then he had to go back to Rome. Now on his way back to Rome, uh, he wrote his last two epistles, first and second Timothy. Uh, he also wrote Titus, which was sent to Titus, who was in the island of Crete, overseeing the work there. And he also wrote First and Second Timothy, uh, which was, of course, written to Timothy, just giving him guidance on how to oversee the work at Ephesus and in that churches in the region. And then Paul, when he went back to Rome later in AD 68, he was killed, martyred. So now we are moving forward in time. So we're going down to 1895. By this time, of course, Paul has gone off the scene. The younger generation whom Paul had trained are mostly off the scene. So Timothy is no longer there. Titus is no longer there. Uh, and, uh, you know, so you can imagine now it's almost 30 years later. 30 years after Paul is gone. The people whom he has trained, many of them have also gone off the scene, passed away. They are not there. There's, uh, you know, other leaders who, other people who have come. We don't have their name. So the church in Ephesus is being led by somebody else. Uh, and these other churches were in that region. 
are also being led by other people. John is now, this is AD 95, right? So we've come forward in time. John, who is the last remaining apostle, very elderly, is in the island of Patmos at this time. And uh, in the island of Patmos, he has this wonderful revelation given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ, which he has recorded for us in the book of Revelation. And uh, uh, the book of Revelation is uh, like the consummation of the Bible. It's like everything prior from Genesis on is like now being brought together. You know, okay, this is what God is, is revealed to us that he's working towards or he's going to accomplish. What started in the Garden of Eden is all going to climax. It's all going to come together beautifully uh, in the last, uh, as, as we see in the last few chapters of Revelation. But getting there is going to be a difficult journey. I mean, uh, there are things that are going to happen which are not going to be good but it's going to ultimately result in the beautiful picture that we see in Revelation chapters 21 and 22. Now, uh, so the book of Revelation is very, very, you know, it, it's, it's, it's wonderful because it's like, this is the final, uh, you know, uh, if you're thinking in terms of some uh, drum or, you know, something that's being, played out this is the final act you know if you if you speak in those terms but also it's a book how how we interpret the book of revelation uh, is also very important because it's like all our understanding of the bible should come into play or should come into come to bear upon how we understand and how we interpret the book of revelation uh, example, we believe in a triune God, Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now that should come into play as we interpret, uh, at least, you know, when we see what's happening. They God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're all at work and that should be consistent. Uh, we see angels at work. So our understanding of angels and what they do comes into our understanding of the book of Revelation. Uh, we see God as omnipotent ruler, who is sovereign, who is bigger and greater than what happens on earth. And that understanding of the sovereignty of God, of the greatness of God comes into play here as we see things unfold in the book of Revelation, even if things on the earth are uh, quite bad. We still believe he is God who is sovereign. And that's proclaimed often in the book of Revelation. Hallelujah, our God reigns. The kings of the earth have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. You know, it's a theme that comes out. And ultimately, we also believe in, because God is sovereign, he's going to wrap everything up the way he wants it done. And that's what we see in the last few chapters of the book of Revelation. We also see God's dealings with the people of Israel. So that starts off in the book of Genesis and it's continued through in the book of Revelation. That in the book of Revelation, God is, there's a special hand of God upon the people of Israel. Right? So we see that. And so our understanding of that continues here in the book of Revelation. So in many ways, in our understanding of the book of Revelation, we are actually bringing in everything prior uh, that we have, we know about God and about his work and who he is and how he's going to handle or how he handles things. It all comes into play when we understand the book of Revelation. So basically we do not, try to interpret or we don't try to understand the book of Revelation in isolation, uh, it's not going to be possible. 
we have to understand the book of Revelation and we have to interpret the book of Revelation in the light of all that we know about God and his, who he is in all of the preceding uh, books, the prior books of the Bible, right? The other thing that uh, we, you know, what I want to say is that um, we are aware that there are different um, ways that people handle the study of the book of Revelation. And therefore, there are different interpretations uh, of the book of, or presentations of the book of Revelation. So examples, some, some just, just to talk about a few, they're just numerous, which I, I don't even know all of them. Uh, that because there's just so many different variations in explaining, explaining and presenting the book of Revelation. But just as an example, a, the, there are people who would take, just as an example, this, what we read in chapters two and three, about the seven churches as representing seven church ages. And there are very eminent scholars who would even do that, or Bible teachers who would do that. They would say that these seven churches are actually representing seven church ages, and then, you know, apply uh, the most, the last one, the church in Laodicea, I think, uh, um, as uh, applying to the current church age, and so on. So that's one way of presenting it, uh, we will not do that. I, I will explain how we are going to approach the book of Revelation. I'm just saying that there are many differing ways in which very respected Bible teachers, Bible scholars uh, handle the book of Revelation. You know, so it's all there uh, the new, in very numerous, numerous ways, many variations. There are also those who may say that the book of Revelation started being fulfilled way back in the times of the early church. Some may even say everything in the book of Revelation was already fulfilled in the time of the early church with the destruction, you know, it all happened right then. Uh, and uh, again, there are just, just so many different variations to how people present the book of Revelation. Now our approach, our approach to studying the book of Revelation. And I am not here, and I don't want to confuse us with many things. Our approach is very simple. First of all, as we start reading it, we will find that, you know, in Revelation chapter one, Jesus told John, I'm going to speak to you about things that are, not things that I have. I want, I want you to write down what you have seen, things that are, and things that are yet to come. So we break the book of Revelation, these three divisions given to John by the Lord Jesus. Things that you have seen, that's Revelation chapter one, what John already saw. Things that are, that means the way things are, were there during John's time, which is chapters two and three. So the, the, the seven churches existed right then and there during John's time, and we will locate them on the map shortly. So that is chapters two and three, meaning those were churches that existed during John's time. And it was a message from the Lord Jesus to those seven churches. What good is it for us then? Well, there's a lot we can learn, you know, from how the Lord Jesus addresses these seven churches, what he looks in these seven churches. And the promise he gives to each of the seven churches, to the overcomers, is something valid for the entire church because all of the seven promises to the overcomer are future. That means they are to be given. They are in the future tense, and therefore they include us as well as overcomers. So there's a lot to learn from chapters two and three, even though he is addressing seven churches that existed right then during John's time. And like we said, they were, the, the, the Paul, the apostle had gone off the scene, the leaders he had trained had gone off the scene. So there were other leaders, we don't know their names, uh, who were taking care of these churches. And sadly, uh, things that, you know, started to decline. 
and the Lord is addressing those problems in those seven churches, even though they were, you know, at one point they had a very rich heritage. They were under the leadership or at least under the influence of the apostle Paul through his ministry, not directly, but through his ministry to the people he trained and through the letters he wrote, they were all under the influence of the leadership and the ministry of the apostle Paul and other apostles. But uh, at that point, 1895, things had begin to, begun to decline in the spiritual condition of these churches. And that is something for us to note and learn from and watch out for. So those were things that are from chapter 4. It is all future. Things that are yet to come. Right? So we will explain that. So we break it down in a very traditional way. So our, our approach is what we would refer to as a very traditional breaking down or a presentation of the study of the book of Revelation. Very traditional. You know, what you have seen, what are, what is yet to come. Yet to come starts with chapter 4. Chapter 4 onwards is future. And even in the breakup of chapter 4 to 22, uh, and I will explain when we come into detail and we start chapter 4, is that, again, we take a very traditional approach, which is that these things are given to us in a chronological order. So that's a very traditional approach. Some modern approaches, you know, mix and match. They overlap three sections of the book of Revelation, all that. We, we don't play with that. We just take it as a simple chronological order. Things that are, things that are yet to come. In a chronological order, we understand, although, that while the Lord is speaking to John about things yet to come in a, in a sequential order, there will be things that he's talking about, which he extends into time, or sometimes he pulls from past, from the past. So you can imagine, suppose you're narrating uh, something to a friend, uh, it just in, you know, just have a normal conversation. Suppose I'm talking to somebody and I'm telling them, you know, okay, you know, these are the things that uh, happened. Uh, then maybe I hit upon an incident and I take that incident and I take it to its conclusion and then I come back to that place in time and I continue on with the story. Or I narrate an incident and I say, okay, well, I need to let you know some background in order to understand this incident. So I go back in time, tell, tell what happened in the past and come back. And then I continue the story or what I'm saying. So those things do happen. And I will point that out. But otherwise, we just take chapter 4 to 22 in a very simple, sequential manner. The Lord Jesus said, these are the way, these are things yet to come. And he's giving them to John in a chronological sequential order. And we are mindful that while he's unfolding that, there would be a time or there would be certain things where he starts off and then he goes to the end and he comes back. So just as an example, and we will see it as we go through, is in Revelation 11, chapter 11, when he talks about the ministry of the two witnesses. So these two witnesses are mentioned only in chapter 11. So he's just talking about them in chapter 11. But in that one chapter, he says, when the ministry starts, and he goes to the end of the ministry. So that means uh, he says they will come in the middle of the tribulation. And then he takes, tells us what they will do till the end of the tribulation for 1,260 days or 42 months. And then he comes back in time to the middle of the tribulation and continues. So that's one example where He's talking to us about the ministry of the witnesses, but they're going to be around for three and a half years. So he tells us in that one chapter, everything they're going to do for three and a half years, this is what they will do. So that means he's about the two witnesses. He goes into future for three and a half years. Then he comes back and then he continues on from that point. So that's an example where, uh, you know, 
although he's speaking in a sequential way, he goes ahead, comes back, and then continues the sequence of events. Right? Or an example of going back in time would be in Revelation 12, he's talking about the great dragon who's Satan. And then he goes back in time to give us a background. Well, this was the old dragon who in times past took one third of the angels with him. So he's going, giving us a background. Okay, who's this dragon, Satan? Well, he's the one who in time past took one third of the heavenly angels with him and he was cast out of heaven at that time. So, okay, telling us about something happening there, but background information comes back here. So like that, you know, so those, those things we should be aware of as we go into the book of Revelation. But otherwise, our approach is very simple. What you see, uh, what you have seen, the way things are, the way things to come, and it's in a sequential order, or a chronological order. So therefore, uh, let me just share uh, this simple chart. It's, it's in the PDF, and I'm just sharing the PDF. Therefore, in our study or in our look at the book of Revelation, uh, we're just going to break it down like this. It's just going sequential. Revelation chapters 1 to 3 is part of the church age, which basically they are things that happened back here in the beginning. So somewhere in AD 95, somewhere here. And we are here still in the church age. And uh, things to come. So Revelation chapter 4 onwards till chapter 19, verse 15, cover these seven years of tribulation. And then chapter 20. First 10 verses are talking to us about 1,000 year period, the millennium. Then chapter 20, verse 11 to 15, deal with the end of the 1,000 years, the millennium. And then chapter 21 and 22, deal with what happens after that, the new heavens and the new earth. Right? So we just it's, it's just looking at it in a very sequential way and understanding the, the major milestones that are being referenced uh, in the book of Revelation. Okay. So uh, just to, yeah, I'll come to that, but I just wanna show this map here. Yeah, so when we, this is what I was uh, mentioning earlier, uh, this is, uh, modern day this whole area belongs to the country of turkey this modern day turkey here was Ephesus uh, on the seaport here and uh, you see the other six churches smyrna they were all uh, uh Pergam, Thyatira, sardis philadelphia laodicea they're all very close by in that same region and so Ephesus, in some way uh was like a mother church to these churches, at least, uh, 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 you know, about 30 years prior. And then you have the island of Patmos, where John, the beloved, was banished or put, sent in exile, kept away, so that he would not have influence on the churches or provide leadership. He was exiled there. But during that time, he had the, the Lord give him this revelation. Okay, just, just to look at the geography. Now, just getting back to a few other things here about the book of Revelation is that, um, so having uh, said that, you know, the, the whole, the how we are going to approach it, uh, uh, what I want to say is that 
there are other ways of presenting the book of Revelation that others take, but this is the way we will take, which is a very, I would say, very traditional approach. Um, people have been doing this in a very simple sequential approach of studying the book of Revelation, looking at it in a chronological manner uh, for a long time. And it's a pretty well-established way to look at the book of Revelation. Uh, a couple other, maybe two more points before we start reading is, and this is something, you know, we, we mentioned in our second year class on uh, the end times and also uh, when we talk about uh, hermeneutics or interpreting scripture, our approach is wherever possible, if you take things literally, that means if, uh, if it said, you know, uh, that a third of the vegetation was destroyed, it's okay. That's what, that's what it means. That's what it says. One third of Earth's vegetation are, will be destroyed. It's literal. We, wherever possible, we take it literally. And when the literal is actually, um, or, or, or sorry, what we read uh, cannot be literally fulfilled, then we say, okay, he is using figurative language, or we would say he's using prophetic imagery. That means he's, he's speaking uh, using images. And those things will then therefore not be taken literally, but be interpreted to get the meaning of what is being said. So I'll just repeat. Wherever possible, as we read the book of Revelation, we take it. Yeah, this is literal. This is what it says. But where the literal, or I mean, so but where the, uh, what is said cannot be, or sh where the literal application or understanding of it would not be consistent either with the rest of scripture or would not be, uh, you know, would be absurd in a practical sense, then we say, okay, that's figurative speech. We need to interpret. So just give an example. The word seven uh, is a word that you see throughout the book of Revelation. From chapter one on, there are seven, the word seven is used many times. Uh, so we have three sets of seven judgments, you know, the, the seals, the trumpets, and then the bowls, seven each, you know, so the word seven is used throughout. Now, in general, generally speaking, the word seven in the Bible represents perfection, something that is perfect, or, you know, it's like, it's, this, there's nothing better than this, you cannot improve on it. Seven represents perfection. Why do we say that? Because uh, in the Bible uh, and in God's creation, you know, there are seven days in a week. A week is complete. It's perfect. Seven days make a perfect week. There are seven colors and the rainbow light has seven colors in it. Complete. Uh, so we look at seven as a representation of perfection, or, or it's a figure of perfection. It's telling us that something is perfect. But we don't just apply that to everything, you read. So when it says seven churches, it means there were literal seven churches. So we, in that case, we don't interpret seven as perfection. We just say, there were seven churches. When it talks about seven, when we talk about the seven seals, the seven trumpets, 
and the seven bowls. There we don't interpret seven as perfection. We simply mean there are literally seven seals that are going to be opened or seven trumpets, seven trumpets, seven, a set of seven judgments or a set of seven bowls, uh, seven judgments, bowl judgments that are coming. Well, that's literal. There's going to be seven, actually seven. So we don't interpret seven there as representing perfection. We take seven there, the number seven as literal. Literally, there were seven churches. There are going to be seven Seal bowl judgments, there are going to be seven trumpet judgments, there are going to be seven bowl judgments. But the word seven, right in chapter one, verse four, when we read, it talks about the seven spirits of God. And then when we come into chapter three and four and five, you see that there are seven lamps of fire representing the seven spirits. There are seven horns representing the seven spirits. And there are seven eyes representing the seven spirits. Oh, can these be taken literal? Are there seven spirits or is there only one Holy Spirit? Well, there's only one Holy Spirit before the before God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. There is one Spirit. We know that from previous texts in Scripture. So, in this particular case, seven spirits have to be interpreted as representing the one Holy Spirit. Why? Because if you say, there are seven Holy Spirits, that would be tearing down everything else that's in the rest of the Bible. It's contradicting, so you, it's absurd. It's not consistent with the rest of the teaching of Scripture. So now we have to say, there's a, this is a figure of speech. Seven Spirits does not mean seven separate spirits, but it's a figure, it's representing the Holy Spirit as the perfect spirit. So here seven represents perfect. So then there are seven lamps of fire representing the seven spirits. Holy Spirit is represented by seven lamps of fire. So are seven lamps of fire that, you know, uh, uh, is the Holy Spirit seven lamps? Is this Holy Spirit seven eyes? Is the Holy Spirit seven horns? No. All this has to be taken as a figure of speech. And we will interpret that when we come there. You know, seven lamps of fire, fire or light. Seven, perfection. Perfect light. Light is everywhere, representing the omnipresence. Seven horns. Horns in scripture always represent dominion, power. So seven horns, perfect dominion, perfect authority, perfect power. Talks about the omnipotence of the spirit. Seven eyes, eyes talking about knowledge, knowing, seven, perfect, perfect knowledge, omniscience. So we are interpreting these figures or images that we are seeing in relation to the Holy Spirit to talk about um, um, his omniscience, his omnipresence, his omnipotence. So in that case, the number seven is not taken literally, but it's taken figuratively. So, what we are saying is, as we read through the book of Revelation, we're going to follow normal hermeneutic principle, which is whatever is literal or can be understood literally, keep it that way. Where the literal is observed or the literal is contrary to the rest of the teaching of Scripture, then you have to say it's figurative and you have to interpret the figurative figure of speech keeping in mind everything else in the Bible, what those images and figures mean in the rest of Scripture, to deduce the meaning of those figures of speech. Um, did I, is it clear? 
uh, or did I confuse you or any questions on that? Was it clear? Do you need me to repeat anything? Everybody with me so far? Okay. Fine. All right. So I see your responses in the chat. And, um, uh, everybody's fine. Okay. So uh, that's a general guidance, you know, our approach to studying the book of Revelation. Now, uh, just, I'll just repeat what I said before we start reading it, which is, in case you find some other books or commentaries or especially um, more recent ones, modern in the last 10 years, where people present the book of Revelation in a different way, uh, don't be surprised because there are, you know, uh, like I already said, people present the book of Revelation or try to break it down or interpret it or study it in different ways. But our approach, as I said, is a very simple approach. Take it the way Jesus gave it to John. What you have seen, what is happening, and what is going to happen. Break, break it down into those just same three portions and take everything sequentially, except where it is um, clearly understood that he is either explaining a particular point all the way through to its end, or reflecting on a particular point with some background information. Other than that, just take it sequentially the way Jesus gave it. And uh, uh, what I feel, and again, this is just my personal understanding, is that it's if you do it like that, it's just very, very clear. You know, the book of Revelation is very clear. It's not very complicated. If you just follow it the way the Lord Jesus gave it, to John. There's no complication, no jumping here and there, confusing people. Uh, because what I found is when people break it up other ways, it's very confusing. And I, I, it almost seems arbitrary when they position things in certain ways. You're like, why are you doing it? Just stay with the sequence uh, the way the Lord gave it. And it's just clear. Okay. So let's begin uh, with chapter one, verse one. Um, and uh, I just, you know, uh, invite everybody to uh, you know, be a part of this. Yeah. So let's just read uh, little by little. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. Somebody could read the first three verses, please. This book is the record of the events that Jesus Christ revealed. God gave him this revelation in order to show his servants what must happen very soon. Christ made these things known to his servant John by sending his angel to him. And John has told all that he has seen. This is his report concerning the message from God and the true truth revealed by Jesus Christ. Happy is the one who reads this book and happy are those who listen to the word of this prophetic message and okay what is written in this book for the time is near when all things will happen mm -hmm. so just um, you know pointing out certain things so this is uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ meaning this is what Jesus the Lord Jesus revealed to the Apostle John to John, his disciple or his apostle, so that John could then pass it on to the followers, the servants of Jesus Christ. So the intent was it's not only for you, John, it's actually a message that you are going to give to everybody else who believes in Jesus. So that's for you and for me. Secondly, uh, I'm looking at verse one. So things which must shortly take place. Now, of course, um, when, we, when, when, when the Lord is saying shortly, then so we need to keep in mind that for him, time is immaterial. Right? His shortly or his quickly and our shortly and our quickly are very different. 
So he's speaking from his perspective. Sean, I'm telling you things are going to happen quite quickly. A day is a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day to God. Meaning, from his perspective, these things are immaterial. Time is immaterial. Sorry. And even when we read the last chapter of Revelation, Jesus says, I'm coming quickly. He repeats that. I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me. Lord. So God, his quickly is very different from our quickly. Our quickly is measured within a lifetime. You know, not even a lifetime. Sorry, it's measured maybe in minutes. I was speaking from our earth time. His quickly is he's outside of time. Okay, so let's not stumble upon the way the book of Revelation begins and the way it ends. It begins and ends but the Lord says things that will happen quickly. And some people stumble on it. They get offended by it, saying, what do you mean quickly? 2,000 years have come and gone and nothing's, you know, where's Jesus? Okay. Don't get offended. Don't stumble on it. Because look at it from the context of the one who speaks. Who is he? He's God. He's outside of time. And his quickly is just doesn't matter. He dwells in eternity. And what are what is 2,000 years in compared to eternity or infinity? Nothing. Okay, it's a small dot compared to infinity. So don't stumble or don't get offended uh, by the quickly that we see in the opening and the closing of the book of Revelation. The other thing in verse 1 is that he sent this message to John by his angel. By his angel. Now, some things to point out. First of all, the meaning of the word angel, the Greek word, is the word angelos, which simply means messenger. And that word angelos is used to represent anyone who's bearing a message from God. It could refer to angelic beings. It could also refer to human beings. It's the same word, angelos. Now, it's like, you know, some other Greek words. For example, the word spirit in the, the Greek is pneuma. And that word spirit can be used to represent God. It can be used to represent angels. It can be used to represent fallen angels or evil spirits. It can also be used to represent the human spirit. But it's one Greek word, pneuma but it can actually represent four different things. So then depending on the context, we will say, we have to say that Numa here represents God or the Holy Spirit, represents an evil spirit or represents an angelic or represents a human spirit. So therefore the word angel, in angelos translated angel. But it could be used to refer to an angel, as in an angel of God. It could refer to a fallen angel. It could refer to a messenger, a human messenger. Okay. So then we have to understand it depending on the context. So you'll find the word angel used throughout the book of Revelation. And depending on the context, we have to interpret it as saying, okay, this refers to a human messenger, or this refers to an angel, or uh, this refers to fallen angels, evil spirits. Okay. And I'll just make the statement. I know it's already over time here. Um, I'll make the statement. We go for a break. That John 
in the book of Revelation does not always receive his message from the angel. No. There are times when he himself sees directly what's happening. There's no angel speaking to him. He is seeing every, these things. There are times when he hears angels speaking. And then there are times when he hears an elder speaking. That means the elder is one of the 24 elders around the throne. That elder is talking to John. So there are three ways in the book of Revelation, John is receiving information. One, he is directly seeing it. Two, an angel is talking or he hears angels talking. Third, he hears an elder talking. So we need to understand, uh, you know, what is happening as we journey through. Okay, so let's pause here. We'll come back and pick this up. I know it's our break time now. So we'll be back in 10 minutes and we'll continue. Okay, thank you.